All right. Yeah. Well, it's seven o'clock and I don't want to hold a whole lot of people up here. Um, let's do this real quick. And everybody can see the, sh the screen share, correct? Oh, it looks good. Okay. So there are people here tonight who have been with the ASIG for a really long time. There are people who are new to what the heck this is all about. Um, that uh, Michael, that Michael Sherman, that ought to be a really good scotch you're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we used to do this quite a bit. Um, uh, the ASIC used to be a very, uh, uh, a very involved group up until probably three years ago or something like that. And what I kind of thought about, you know, I mean, somebody kind of kicked me once or twice and said, well, why don't you restart ASIC? And I said, well, gee, because, you know, maybe there's other things to do. But <clears throat> the idea here is to try to get everybody reinvolved and reengaged in this whole, in the whole, this, the whole process. Um, we kind of started this off back in 2004, 2005. Um, I picked it up as the ASIC chairman right around 2010, something like that. And, um, it, it turned out to be pretty successful. We uh, we started doing things. We started uh, having meetings at the uh, Mission Trails uh, Regional Theater. Um, I was able to get some pretty good speakers um, online, uh, and it worked pretty well. So basically, what we've done in the past is we've gotten some guest speakers. We've done a whole lot of work with hardware, uh, which has dramatically changed over the past four or five years. We've done um, we used to talk a lot about Photoshop, if anybody remembers doing imaging work <laughs> with Photoshop. Um, we did a whole lot of, like I said, we used to meet, we, in several times, we used to meet up here in the cul-de-sac that I live in, and we had 15 or 20 telescopes set up in the cul-de-sac that, uh, that's pretty close, that in front of my house, just mostly A, because I'm the only house in it, B, you could foot, you know, put a whole bunch of cars in it, and I got a view of the North Star, so we used to have um, uh, we used to have just help sessions here in the current parking lot or here on the, in the cul-de-sac for folks who were having issues. So it's kind of a wide ranging thing we wanted, we started doing. Realistically, I don't want I didn't want to take a whole lot of time tonight because we don't, I don't have a subject material, but what I wanted to do was to get everybody kind of together in the same place and start talking about what people would like to learn and what people in the group can teach others. Like I said, there's quite a few folks here who've been doing this for a while. Mr. Parks has been uh, been very active in taking pictures for a while. I know that Jerry Hilburn is an extremely accomplished extra, uh, astrophotographer. So we've got lots of folks here who've been doing this and hopefully we'll be able to share some insights on what they do. Um, so, um, just kind of moving on down the line. And, and again, I'm not muting anybody's microphone. Feel free to open up, talk, chat, all that fun stuff. Um, we've got uh, currently right now, we're jumping into, you know, look like we're moving into 35 people here, which is better than I expected. Um, so feel free to jump in and, and kind of um, kind of ask questions, uh, jump in as far as if you've got some ideas about what you'd like to, what you'd like to learn. Uh, jump over here real quick. I have a laundry list. <laughs> Who's that, Hilburn? Yeah. <laughs> I don't doubt it. So I never joined the Pix Insight Revolution. I was one of those Photoshop guys way back at the beginning when we started this. And uh, I'm fascinated because I found there's this one program called APP, and then there's Pix Insight. And I'm curious if somebody has experience with both what you could talk about between the two. I, I think that PixInsight is way more capable or more complex, but um, if anybody has experience with APP and PixInsight, I'd be really interested to hear something about the differences between the two. Um, funny, funny, you should, funny you should mention that, Jerry. I think right here, I've got actually talking about Axel, uh, what is it? It's Astro Pixel Processor, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's um, um, there has been uh, some talk about it. I've actually had a chance to use it. And because my brain has been so polluted by Pix Insight, I kind of went, 
huh, huh, this is really difficult to use. But I do know there's quite a few folks out there that are using it. Um, I downloaded it, and uh, the, I'm going to do that 45-day Pix Insight, and I figured this would be the group where um, people that really know that could talk about those differences. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'd like um, to talk about Nina and autofocus uh, from 600 millimeters to 2,800 millimeters and the differences in the settings. I think there's a formula that's useful in wide field that doesn't work well in a longer focal length. And so uh, it might be interesting to have a discussion about uh, um, uh, formulas for autofocus at different uh, field lengths, focal lengths. Uh, I'm really fascinated with how do you do comments with a, a filter wheel and get uh, a color arrangement when that damn thing keeps moving. Right. Or option B, how do you teach your um, uh, Los Mondi G11 uh, to track a comet so that you can stack with uh, filter wheel images. Um, I am deep in exoplanets and exoplanet watch and, and publishing and, and that side. So I'd be happy to run a session on that if it's uh, useful for uh, purposes of talking about that here. And I'm running a thing called Tico Tracker for synthetic uh, analysis of uh, asteroid tracks and and also for doing asteroid light curves. And so if there's anybody that's uh, interested in that, I'd love to talk about that at length. Also, submissions to the Minor Planet Center that I'm doing. I think that'd be fun to talk about. And I want to buy a C11 Muse. So if anybody has one for sale, please let me know. And that's my laundry list. <laughs> AC Wood here. Yeah, you want to see 11? I've got one for sale. Do you have another internet browser? Or is that the one we have? How much is it? You have Google Chrome? Well, we can discuss that. So a lot of people, just out of curiosity, um, uh, I had a question. Like somebody came up to, uh, a little bit earlier today and asked, "Does anybody in the group do planetary? Do, do they do planetary any longer? Has anybody be, anybody been doing planetary imaging here?" I see some head shakings. I see Clarence doing some stuff. Actually, that's what I want to do with my sputter. I think it's it's an ideal starting point to do planetary, and of course, it's probably so pedestrian for you guys. But I'd like to start there with, uh, you know, this the spotter that I have and figure out what the minimum equipment is that can get me going. You'd kind of be surprised at what it takes to do it. Um, I tried it and failed and said, well, OK, that's not my expertise. But I know that uh, um, certainly uh, Woody Schloem, if you're if you've seen Woody around, Woody has got has got all sorts of experience doing planetary. He's got a. A little mobile observatory that can be switched back and forth between two and live stuff with um, okay. uh, is uh, live stuff with with uh, DSO and he does he used to, he used to do planetary quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, I'm looking here. I have less on this, and, but I, you know, I can't work with this. Have you tried turning it this way? Brian's got his hand up. I just. Who's got his hand up, Brian? What's what's what you got a question for, Brian? A little better. It's not so much a question, but per se, but I mean, I've been trying to do astrophotography for years, mostly without success. Sorry, I'm walking around on my iPad, but, uh, you know, perhaps one of the things, that, and it just ex escapes my mind, is everything from focal length and, and the very basics, like, okay, I can put a, uh, a Canon camera on the back of my, my old Ultima C8. And try and take a picture and, and guesstimate, okay, maybe it's 15 seconds or whatever to, you know, for exposure time. But when it starts coming into focal lengths and aperture settings and all this other stuff, not only on the camera, but how do you convert that and uh, attribute that to what the type of telescope you're using and everything else, that all escapes me. Um, you know, to me, it's just been pure guesswork. And more often than not, the pictures that I do take even before you start talking Photoshop or in the old days and image stacking and all that stuff, it just blows my mind. So I think from a beginner standpoint, okay, you know, personally me, I'm, I'm a, you know, 
less on theory, more on practice, on practical. Um, so for me, it'd be like, okay, if you want to take a picture of the moon or the Andromeda galaxy, you know, at these settings, this is what you should probably look at, not only for real time work, but also you know, trying to learn a little bit of the theory behind it in the math, if you will, just to come up with a baseline of knowledge beyond <laughs> all the other fun stuff that this hobby entails. I mean, my very first astrophotography was on a Minolta 35 millimeter camera, you know, old film back in the day. So, um, you know, from, for us new guys, I think it'd probably be a good thing to have a discussion on that at some point, you know, if it's in the field or whatever. So I just wanted to bring that up, but I'm, I'm excited. Finally got out of the city. Anybody here doing spectroscopy? I know Dave Decker was going to, oh yeah, Frank, you're doing spectroscopy. Yeah, I am. In fact, I saw Dave Decker last, last week at SAS, Society for Astronomical Sciences. And uh, astrophotography is so addictive and it can lead to other things like photometry and can lead to spectroscopy. So uh, after I did a lot of astrophotography, I actually joined AAVSO and took some of their courses and learned how to do uh, photometry. And of course, a lot of people also do exoplanets using photometry. And, but I, I haven't really done that. And then after I did photometry, that led to spectroscopy. So, and I have my little uh, spectrometer here. And we presented a few papers last week at the at the SAS symposium on spectroscopy. And San Diego had a good representative group uh, with uh, the Boyce Foundation and student papers being presented. And uh, so uh, lots of things that can spin off out of uh, astrophotography here. I, uh, just like a lot of expertise here. Frank, I, I never knew that anyone wanted to do spectroscopy for a hobby, you know, oh, yes. your, your day job. But you look, you look the perfect image of a spectroscopist to me, a very happy, jovial, wide bearded fellow that just loves the technical details. And we have several characters in our field that are spectroscopists. It's like, geez, you know, <laughs> there's a spectroscopist. Spectroscopy is the key to understanding the universe there. We can't do without it. An amateur spectro spectrometer uh, participants can do things that professionals can't do because we have our own telescope and we can dedicate it to our targets of interest. Professionals can't do that. They'll never get the, the telescope time. Oh, the runtime. That's that's a very good point. Um, yes. I'm struggling to understand the relationship between amateur astronomy and so-called professional astronomy. And you hit on something that I hadn't quite understood. It's, it's the importance of uh, runtime yes. that a professional has to compete for. And the that's fact right. that you get all the runtime that the skies allow you. That's right. And number two reason is a lot of uh, satellite telescopes and professional ground telescopes are so sensitive, they can't see the bright targets. And guess what? We can see the bright targets easily with our small telescopes. So we have a, an advantage and we're looking at the sky and with your astrophotography images, you're taking images, often blinking through your images, you can discover new things before some of the uh, professionals discover things because you're on the sky and looking every night. So lots of things going for us. So. Very cool, Frank, thank you. Hey, Frank, could I catch you, uh, could I sign you up on one, one of these meetings in the next eight, eight, eight or nine months about doing a presentation on, on spectroscopy? Oh, sure, yep, sounds okay. good. Um, and uh, Gary, you ought, we ought to tap into Gary Hawkins' work also, because yes. Gary was at the conference also, and Gary is interested in color cameras, 
So you don't need to do change filters with your astrophotography. And so you can do photometry and astrophotography with simple color cameras. So uh, he, he has some interesting ideas that he's, he's presented some papers on that topic. So he's another speaker. Mr. Hilburn, could we get you on one night talking about astro, talking about tracking rocks in space? Yeah, that'd be fun. I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, Dave. Yo. So following up on Brian's comment. Uh-huh. Uh, so I, I think I fall in that category. I've done some back in the day before digital and I'm a rank amateur now. And so I've watched a lot of YouTube videos, but is, would it be possible to have like a boot camp, maybe a Saturday where we spend, you know, several hours maybe with, with rookies and here's, you know, here's what you do. Here's sort of the equipment. Here's the software. Um, I watched several YouTube videos where a guy actually went from very beginning to end and it was highly instructive but i'm suspicious that they're biased and it would be nice to have an interactive uh, discussion with people who actually know um you know does this stacking program be better than that one or whatever i mean there are several things like that that i suspect the people that know would sort of snicker at but if you don't know there's a lot of options and it would be fun to just have a, like say a boot camp. Uh, that's something we definitely have done in the past. Um, and I'm sure we could probably put something like that together. Um, uh, I kind of mentioned earlier on that, that we used to have little star parties in my cul-de-sac up there. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at some, some of the stuff in the chat window. Um, they, um, we used to uh, we used to actually have uh, a bunch of people bring bring their bring their setups up here uh, to the cul-de-sac I'm in. We'd run a bunch of extension cords out there, have some beer on the sides, and have um, have some of the more experienced imagers help the help the beginners put stuff together. But as far as a you know few hour beginning overall class, we could certainly put something together as far as a Zoom session goes and just kind of walk through it. That'd be real straightforward. Well, either one of those options would, I think, be real helpful because it's one thing to watch a YouTube video. It's another thing to have an interactive session with your own things, primitive as they may be. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I will plus one on that as far as interest goes. I <clears throat> Just a little more background on me is um, I got out of the hobby probably 10 or 15 years ago, because I found that uh, raising kids and trying to spend time with them and spend time and money on astrophotography wasn't working out too well. But now that my kids are uh, older, I am uh, putting together the equipment again to, to get back into the hobby. And I would say that pretty much everything I've done I, I is self-taught. So I've taught myself a lot of bad habits probably a lot of uh, misinformation um, has contributed to uh, my lack of growth. So I'd really like to um, get back into the basics and learn from some folks who uh, have done this for a while rather than trying to do it on my own. Well, that's what the ASIC started off. That's what, uh, that's what we're doing quite some time ago. Um, somebody here, is it worth take, thinking this group is needing to be able to cover two extremes, the exp uh, beginners and learners uh, versus quite advanced. And the answer is, yeah, um, that's one of the things we tried in the past that we tried to uh, tried to, uh, to incorporate. Um, how many of you guys are, are on the uh, on the ASIC, um, at the uh, group's IO page? I mean, it's, um, I very rarely see a whole lot of activity there. Um, it might be a good place to start getting a little bit more active and start asking questions such as you know, equipment issues, things along that line, just to get just to get people reinvolved. I rarely, if ever nowadays, see anything on that group's IO, but it might be worthwhile to do that. 
Um, yeah, beer would help. Um, no, the, so the, uh, and you can go ahead and unmute and ask questions. It's no big deal. Uh, Gio, it's, um, it's, the, it's the group's IO page. So there is a, um, a, a, a if you will, a sister uh, group to the, uh, to the group site, to the SDAA group's IO page. Um, I will have Mike, uh, Mike Vandervorst uh, send out, I, I don't know who administers the, the, the ASIC stuff, but I'll, I know Mike Vandervorst is the, is the primary guy on it. I'll have him send out uh, an invite and see if we can get uh, uh, on the group's IO stuff. Dave, maybe it would be an idea here since we, you have 35 people, are you somehow documenting who we are so that as information goes in and out that we can get on the list, basically? Uh, I don't know that I've got a list of participants um, on a Zoom call. Um, if you, so what of you know, what if, if you, so real quickly, something you guys can probably do is if you want to sign, you put your name on just on a sign up. I can collect the list. If you're on the meeting, go ahead and send um, just send a message to ASIG at sdaa.org, and that should end up in my inbox, uh, and that'll get me a list of folks that I can that I can go ahead and and put together as far as participants of the class. And actually, if you want to send um, send an email to ASIC at sdaa.org and just say, hey, these are the things I'm interested in based on the conversation tonight. That that work, that I, I can work that out. <laughs> yes, Howard, my level is 15 second exposures of the Milky Way. Yes. It um and sometimes uh, yes, copy. So yes, message to ASIC at sdaa.org. That's correct. Um, I'm curious how many people um uh, out there that have been doing, I know there's quite a few people that are using Nina. I know very little about it. Uh, are, is there anybody out here, Jer Jerry? You've done doing a lot of work with Nina. Yeah, uh, I switched over from SGP. I used SGP for about five years, and uh, then somebody said you got to try Nina. Actually, it was Doug Solacy who recommended it. Um, and uh, so when I picked up this new equipment, I, I moved over to Nina, and it's uh, pretty damn good. Uh huh. How does it compare off to things like the Sky X and 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 Maxim DL and and those types of things? I think it's much easier to learn and use. Way wow. easier to do sequencing, complex sequencing as well. Uh huh. And it has two levels. You can do a quick single sequence out of it, just to you know take uh, something quick to do. And uh, the other thing that I love about it is that it's have it handles meridian flips seamlessly. Uh, if you're on an equatorial mount, I, I've really been uh, impressed with it. One of the things I always battled in uh, the other programs I used was really finding that moment when the flip should happen and scheduling it in between shots. And uh, Nina just takes care of it. Okay. Simplicity wise, compared to something like nebulosity, because Craig Stark stuff was always fairly simple to get going. Would you put it on that kind of a level as far as being able to get a beginner to run the th run the stuff? I don't know nebulosity, but I will say that between the Sky X, uh, Nina, or the Sky X, and then what was that custom stuff that the guy did that was in that, uh, Pat's observatory to start with? I forget his name. He wrote the ASCOM driver standards. Um, but that well, Bob, was come. Go ahead, Bob, Bob Danny. Danny. Bob yeah, Danny. Yeah, Danny's software was super complex. Yeah, that's uh, AC. That's ACP. Um, yeah, ACP yeah, was that's... too complex. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. SGP was uh, better than the other two, and now Nina has really uh, one up SGP. Uh huh. It's simple. I could teach somebody how to set up a full stack in a in half an hour. Wow. Yeah. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm Yijou. I'm new to the group, but I've been in astrophotography for about 10 years and I operate my remote observatory for for two years and over. Um, I'm interested in this topic and just share my opinion that uh, the automation software can go as deep as it can get. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex topic, but I would like to, if there's opportunity, I can share my experience. I'm, I'm on the Nina and uh, I've been using another software called Voyager, which is um, 
um, similar to the full automation program. And, and there's a lot of things you can do, but it's a, it's a pretty deep conversation. And I, yeah, no, I've, I've, I started looking at Voyager as an alternative, as a possible alternative to HCP. The biggest issue with Voyager right now is it won't do uh, it won't do de it won't do deep sky objects and uh, exos on the same night, at least as yeah. far as I can tell. That's kind of one of its its issues that we're yeah. going to run into. Yeah, um, there, there there are all kinds of pros and cons for for different right. programs. It's it's about picking what you need and what works the best for you. Exactly. And and I think Nina is definitely a popular option, given it's free and it's uh, a lot of plugins providing different. Uh, capability of doing different things. I, I will be interested in either joining or giving a section talking about all these automation programs okay. and the, the plugins and the capabilities. That would be interesting. Okay. And I just want to say hi, folks. <laughs> yeah, uh, is, how do you pronounce your first name? Is it uh, Yuzu? Ijo, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've looked at your, your Astrobin page. Congratulations, you've got more uh, pictures of the day than just about anybody I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, so um, it kind of sounds one of the things that in looking on the beginner side of this stuff, um, one of the things we probably ought to look at is at least having having a, a session on all the different image capture stuff, because there's there's you know two major if you get if you're going to get involved in this, you've got to understand the best way to capture data based on the equipment you've got and then the best way to process it. Um, so it kind of sounds like we need to have at least one session on, on image capture stuff. I'm just writing some jotting some notes down here. Um, Anybody have a favorite operating system? As far as, a, as, as <laughs> from, from a perspective of image capture or whether you run it on a Mac or a PC? Yeah, good question. Um, I've got a lot of experience with the Sky with uh, the Sky Ten and Maxim DL, just because that's what Taro uses, and and it's it's that's a nightmare unto it itself. Right. But I think Nina has a great deal. I mean, I've been talking and listening to a lot of people that are using Nina a lot, and it sounds like that is one of the up and coming programs. Certainly, I'd like to hear about it. One of my projects for the next year or two is getting rid of Windows because that's not very reliable, especially when they upgrade the software or there's a new yeah. release comes out. So I'm looking at free software that goes on a Raspberry Pi that controls acquisition. So you can use free open source software, uh, get rid of the expensive software. And a group of us are looking at StellarMate as an option, looking at Indy, I-N-D-I, maybe K-Stars and Echoes as options, and using more of a Linux-based operating system so we can do, do some science-based data along with our astrophotography. So that, that's sort of my plans for the future. Because right now I'm using Maxim DL and uh, so it's a little expensive in ACP. Oh, okay. ACP guy, you're right. You got familiar with all them scripts, huh? Yes. But we should be able to do that with free software, though, and open source software. So another another thing that people kind of want to know about, at least in the past, they've been kind of, I am, I am, I have to admit, I am CMOS stupid. Um, all of my past, you know, 15, 18 years in imaging has always been done around CCDs. And I have paid little or no attention to CMOS stuff, other than the fact that at uh, AIC uh, last year, they had an incredibly good session on comparison of CMOS versus CCD. And it basically said, you know, all of you using CCDs, you ought to go, you know, you know, go float down the, uh, go float down the Mississippi on a barge. Um, they uh it's it's the, the new C, the new CMOS stuff is absolutely incredible but i think from a again you know from an from an imaging hardware type of thing one of the things that might be a good idea is having a a, a session on a comparison between ccds uh or at least a comparison between what's good in cameras these days what's up and coming and stuff um so and you know i i'd listen to that one just because i don't know anything about cmos cameras um 
I don't know that mounts have changed a bunch over the past years. I, I think that they're still the, the major mount manufacturers are still doing the same things. I don't know if anybody can comment on it one way or the other, but it seems to me that that uh, uh, Lowe's Mondi and Software Bisque and Celestron and and a few others are still hanging there doing the same thing. Has anybody noticed anybody from the experience bike run into some really remarkable changes in mounts? The harmonic really? mounts seem yes, to have really stepped forward. <laughs> plain wave, dollar sign, dollar sign. No, I mean, ZWO and a lot of other people have come up with harmonic mounts that are fairly reasonable. Oh, they have. Okay. Yeah. And they seem to be really accurate. The people who have them really, really like them. Okay. What's a harmonic mount, if you can just say in a few, briefly? I there can't. I <laughs> cannot. <laughs> it just looks like a cube. I don't even know how, the, how it works. It seems to be more like an as, alt as, but it can't be. You know, I have no idea. It, it uses strain wave uh, type uh, approach. So you don't have necessarily the belt and gears. So theoretically, they say it has no periodic RA, um, but um, uh, it's 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 totally different. Huh? And who's manufacturing them? Just out of curiosity. Um, ZWO has two, like has has them. Um, Ioptron's coming out with them. Oh, okay. You know. Um, Pegasus Astro's got one. So more and more people are, are coming out with them. And they, they, you can either get it for both RA and Jack or just um, RA and, and kind of have more of the belt, uh, gear and belt on your deck. Um, so, yeah. Interesting. How what's a cost comparison to like, a, like an Ioptron you know, CGM 60 or something or CGM 40? You know, it's it it's the, the the major selling point is is it can carry uh, it's small and it can carry more weight for its size. You know, and um, you don't necessarily, depending on how much weight you have, have to use a counterweight. That's that's probably the biggest selling point. Um, they'll they'll rate them up to roughly a certain amount, and you don't need to use a counterweight. So it's a uh, a lot more portable than the traditional equatorial now. Wow. Oh, okay. And while I'm talking, uh, and I don't know if this is one area I'm interested in getting, uh, learning a little more about is um, um, uh, EAA, um, electrical assisted astronomy. I don't know if that's something that you know this forum would touch base on um and it's more of an interest to you know to to kind of show people quick and dirty what you can do with a camera versus you know wait wait for me to do five nights of capturing images and stacking them and give you a picture um it's, it's kind of like something my family you know i can share with my family easily so i'm kind of interested in, in diving into that this is uh, john weigel so dave you should sign up gary hawkins for ea yep. i've got gary on the list already so he's he can give two talks and... yeah. <laughs> i just want to add that the harmonic drive mons has its clear pros and cons it's it's definitely good on the capacity side easier if you want to just backpack your stuff, small scope into locations. By design, harmonic drive has pretty high PE and pretty steep PE. So you just need to have a shorter guiding exposure to, to compensate and fight against that. And there, there, there are different things, but that's, that's definitely a, a revolutionary mount design that's impacting the market. That's interesting. Wow. Uh, so basically something that's gonna be really good for short focal length, uh, short exposure photography, it sounds like. I think it is. Yeah, if you yeah. go to long exposure or even long focal lens, 
equipment. And maybe if you consider going to remote operation, there are some challenges associated with, with this mount. The traditional yeah. gear and wall mounts do have its place. <laughs> For those what that mount, are what mount do you use? I have uh I'm, I'm traditional. <laughs> I have um I have ASA time micro and uh, AP. That's what we're using. So with with uh, absolute encoders uh, and with sky modeling, there's some high end mounts that allows you to go go unguided uh, at maybe one meter or two meter focal length into 15, 20 min mi minutes exposure. There's some crazy high accuracy mounts out there. So am I doomed with the Celestron CPC 1100 mount? Not doomed, um, but it is, uh, take it from yours truly, I, I, I drank the mead Kool-Aid when I jumped into this thing, lock, stock, and barrel, and started trying to image off of an 11, off of a 12-inch mead LX200, um, thinking that it was an easy way to go. And I will tell you that the easiest thing to do is to use your CPC-11 for a guide scope and piggyback on it a 66 millimeter something with a one-shot color camera on it. Um, you will find that imaging at longer, the longer the focal length, the more difficult it becomes to control what it is you want to do with it. Um, a lot of people tend to, a lot of people, the more successful folks in the club have actually started very simply with a 35 millimeter camera or something like that with a 135 millimeter lens stuck on a one hour sky tracker. Um, it's uh, it's once you once you wander off into longer focal lengths, it gets significantly more difficult to guide and things like that. It's uh, that's a it's an interesting, frustrating way to go. Um, but there one of the things to be aware of is that um, uh, we have. Um, uh, we are putting together for the loner scope program. Um, um, the loner scope program actually is being put together. Uh, we're actually putting together a, a beginning astrophotography rig for the loner scope program. And, and uh, hopefully that'll be out here shortly. You'll find more, but I think you'll hear more about that as uh, as it comes online. But that'll be one of the loner scope program is a beginning is a beginning astrophotography rig. You'll be able to rent. Okay, uh, I am not uh, <laughs> I'm not watching the meeting chat window very much. If you guys got uh, if you guys got something up, let me know because I'm not watching it pretty closely here. I've got uh, uh, as things are going along. Um, hey Dave, it's B. Yeah. There's a ton of people in the text chat, including myself, that are, well, as you know, absolutely new. Yep. Um, you've told me I need to move on from imaging the moon. <laughs> so, <laughs> There's nothing wrong with imaging the moon. Not one thing. <laughs> yeah, that's real simple. I, I, you know, I'd like, I'd really like to learn some some advanced techniques, but I maybe a lot of people would be open to just a rookie boot camp that you were talking about where we yeah. all come, come and set up our equipment. I love the idea of your cul-de-sac. I've been there many times. Oh, are you yeah. open to doing something like that oh, sooner yeah. or later? I'm oh, not absolutely. sure that people are local to do that, but there's a ton of people in chat that are just really wanting to get a start. Yeah. Um, I bought absolutely. some new equipment. It's been three weeks. So I think the weather curse has passed, but I'd love just for some pointers on how to set it up, you yeah. know? And get going. Yeah, I'm just kind that's, of cruising. That's through. what I'm seeing in the chat. Yeah, well, that's kind of I'm just cruising through it. And the answer is absolutely we can do something like that. Cool. Awesome. Um, I, I don't think that's a huge thing. Um uh, and I imagine Frank probably still has some really simple gear he can set up and show folks because he took some really good pictures in the cul-de-sac at one point in time. Nice. Yeah. That's just yeah, set we'll, so, up in the backyard. No? Yes. Yeah, so, so I've got that, uh, what I've done is I've actually circled that big time to see if we can get a, a boot class, um, yeah. a boot class set up and all that fun stuff. And it'll cover, I mean, it's, it's you know, we can, the, the uh, a boot camp or something with just the basic gear, we can kind of do a real quick cover of this is where you kind of want to start at, things like that. We certainly can do something like that. Awesome. Um. 
the other side of this game is processing. And hey, you know, right here, Astro Pixel Processor. Jerry, I'd be curious to see what you how that comes up. But there's there's a lot of talk now about Pix Insight. If you uh, I think I started showing people how to use Pix Insight back in 2011, 2012, something like that. Um, back then it was it back then it was it was more step by step involved than what's evolved now, which has become much more process oriented. Uh, and to the effect that even um, there's a couple of folks uh, that are starting to do some really inc uh, amazing stuff with AI. Uh, a guy named Russell Crowman has come out with three different uh, AI tools that you can now plug into PixInsight that will do amazing things. Um, and whereas before, when you integrated and stacked up all the images, you had to register them on, you, know, you had to do a separate step for, for registration. You had to you know, do separate stuff for calibration. Nowadays, there's actually one step that does it. And the only thing that it requires is a computer with a good amount of horsepower. Um, so it's in the past, we've done separate sessions. We've actually taken and done a simple one-shot color workflow that took about six or seven steps in Pix Insight to make pretty pictures. We've taken individual processes uh, and demonstrated individual processes in the past. Um, but it kind of depends on how many of the how many people here tend to want to use Pix Insight for doing its stuff. As Jerry said, there are folks out there that are probably still doing Photoshop. Uh, and I haven't been following. I, mean, I started off doing Photoshop, but then you know fell off onto the Pix Insight bandwagon just because I threw a whole bunch of money at it. Figured I'd better use it. Um, I mean, how many? You know, it's of, of the folks here. How many folks are using Pix Insight? Uh, Frank, you, you use it quite a bit, or yeah, yeah, you know, I like Pix Insight. Yeah, is you you, you uh, I assume you're using it as well. I want to learn it. I, I I haven't even bought it yet. I'm going to do that 45 day trial and, that they offer and uh, dip my toe in it. I think sure, 45 one of the days isn't nearly enough. It's so <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I they you should know, make a three months free trial or something to. <laughs> yeah, I have been doing APP and in a day is enough to learn what it can do. It's really nice. But in simple and fairly powerful, but the uh, Pix Insight has a lot of interesting things that APP doesn't do. So I'm going to have to just live with that 45 day thing until I part with the money for it. Because what is it like 260 euros? So yes, um, they are uh, still not understanding most of it. Yes, uh, recently switched the jump, and yes. Um, it's you could spend there. So I'll back up the train a little bit. Uh, and I'm not plugging any one particular trainer or another. You've got Adam Block out there that's putting together a whole host of sessions um, on Pix Insight, and he gets so far the weeds will drive you nuts. Um, you've got uh, Ron Breacher uh, and crew at the Masters of Pix Insight. Actually, the Masters of Pix Insight has a four part freebie introduction course that's actually pretty good that'll give you a quick taste on what it takes to do that. Um, there are, and we could probably find some other, you know, folks that could get started. The basic thing is how do you start? What do you need and how do you start to get it going? And frankly, that's a 10 minute discussion on what it takes to put things together. There's a new process that's been developed over the past, I don't know, call it three months called, um, weighted batch pre-processing and in the past um, what was known as just batch pre-processing there was a big split in the in the pix insight industry or in the pix insight world um, that uh, said no no you don't want to use it because it's not very accurate it doesn't do all the right stuff that's really changed juan canero and gang over in spain that, does, that builds this thing have really remarkably changed the process for for weighted batch pre-processing. It actually now does auto cropping. Uh, so even if your pictures don't align properly, it'll actually auto crop them for you. Um, 
it is truly amazing how easier it has gotten, at least to the point of getting you master elements. So if you're depending on if you're, um, yeah, Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy Hendrix, the master of photography, yes. Um, he, uh, the, it's, it's actually to the point where once you've got all of your appropriate calibration stuff, and we can kind of talk about that as a process, we can have a, a session that just talks about what is it that you need to make pretty pictures. Um, once you kind of got the four different elements of flats, bias, darks, and lights together, um, the weighted batch pre-processing in Pix Insight actually goes pretty quick. And it's pretty easy to load them up. After that, then, then the world gets all changey as far as what you want to do with it. But, uh, but that is really, really, uh, really easy. Uh, I'm just sitting here looking at some of the stuff to, uh, um, and, and coming through the chat window. Uh, by the way, I can, I'll save the chat window, and I think I can publish that out so folks can read that separately. I can push that out to, to, uh, to the group just to, so everybody can take a look what's going on in the chat window. Um, they uh is it, anybody else familiar with what else is out there i know there's there's a, what is it astro image j that does the exoplanet stuff yeah right. and it's great it's great for asteroids it's great for running uh you know exoplanet type work if you're trying to do that it's good at uh limited types of stacking especially if you're doing like i have the sloan photometric set and uh I like to do differential uh photometry on certain stars that i'm trying to determine if they're variable over a course of many months. So I've been taking and shooting different parts of the sky throughout the year, saving the images, and then going back the next year, shooting them again, and then running them through Astro MSJ to see if there's variability. And uh, that gives me in the target areas that I look for certain kinds of things I'm interested in. Uh, year after year, it gives me something to look at from variable photometry. But I would never recommend it to anybody uh, to do any kind of pretty picture work. You'll right, drive yourself just, mad. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just, it's, I know that Scott Dixon, who's not on the call tonight, has been very active with, um, uh, with exoplanets and stuff. And I know you, he uses Astro MSJ all the time. Yeah, I do too. For, uh, for at least work. Tarot, um, Tarot's been used extensively for Astro, for, uh, for uh, exoplanet work. And um, and he does a lot of stuff with Astro MSJ. Um, I don't know what else is out there these days. You know, like I said, what's Pix Insight? Uh, if if is if anybody else knows anything other than Astro Pixel processor, uh, and Jerry, if you get us if you get a chance once you get your um, um, uh, if if you get a feel for it, I mean, feel free to to you know put out a note note and have you jump on and do a quick overview of the thing. Um, okay. There, there's at least three club members that I know of. Um, Claudio Martin, who the gentleman who played guitar, uh, who was the guitar player at the um, at the banquet this year, um, is an, is very much an Astro Pixel processor user uh, to the point where he, he really wants to learn. He he's really really interested in learning Pix Insight, but his stuff that he does with uh, Astro Pixel processor is really good. It, it looks fine. So if, if if you feel like Jerry, you get a chance. Get, oh, you know, get him to do it. He's he knows what he's doing. I'm on a free trial. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> um, Cla Claudio is a great guitar player, and he knows how to make pretty pictures. I don't know that he could actually explain much in the way of Astro Pixel processor. So, and I know you actually can explain things to regular people. I've seen it happen. Hey, I, I just want to tell everybody if you're thinking about getting a new refractor, which I just did this month. After 20 years of working with a really old Orion ED80, uh, the focuser, you couldn't attach an EAF to it. So I got a new refractor. I bought one of those Ascar 5s that has the 80 and the 60 head, and then the reducer, the flattener, and the uh, expander. And it is an amazing telescope. It's like having three telescopes in one. Wow. So if you're interested, hit me yeah. up. Clarence, you got a question? No, I was I was just gonna say I uh, ordered uh, an Ascar 80 PHQ, and I'm waiting for that to come in August. So it's a little 80 by 600, but yeah, let me know how yours goes. Um, Peter, you asked uh, what would be helpful is a list of 
which ASIC members consider themselves enough of an expert. I'm not sure that anybody is ever enough of an expert in this game, but I think that if you were to uh, ask for some help out on the, uh, oh, hey, Stuart's here. Um, if you were to ask for some uh, some rundown, certainly people on the uh, um, on the on that group's I/O page, there's a lot of folks out there. There's certainly run down a list. Heck, if you wanted to send me, so I have a specific. Can I mail that to a person? You can send it to me. Send it to uh, Taro at sdaa.org. Um, yeah, I guess my concern there was not wanting to spam the entire group with. Is my question about my very specific camera, very specific mount? I don't. In, in as far as the ASIC group goes, there's really there. There's you're going to find a whole bunch of useful help. A lot of people are very helpful on it. So um, mostly because everybody's been down this road before, and uh, I think that if just putting out the information, hey, this is the stuff that I got. What would you do? You know, it can can I make it work? Uh, what do I need to change? Things like that. I think you'd find a whole lot of good responses out there. So that would be the I.O. group you direct. Yeah, the, yeah, group. the 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 uh, the ASIG groups groups I.O. page. Yeah, yeah. I will. Thanks. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll message out to uh, uh, to Mike Vandervoort this evening after we're done here and have him send out invites or send out a way so that people at least on the on the um, on the members um, Facebook page and on the main. Uh, uh, I the group, the main groups, I hope the sdaa.groups.io page. I'll have him send out instructions on how to get registered for it because it's there's quite a few folks out there that have been, been down the same uh, uh, been down the same track. Yeah, and then just while I'm unmuted, um, just, just while I'm here, um, you know, it feels to me like there, there's some great experts in this call already now, but I'm not, I'm a beginner learner. And yeah, I do wonder if um, any ASIC meetings need to be sort of dual track. You know, the, the learners don't need to go to the expert track and vice versa almost. Uh, it's possible. I mean, again, once we set up, once we kind of get a, um, a, a, you know, a schedule set up, um, you know, we can say, we can, you know, this is more of an expert based thing and see how people see people want to join or this is more of a beginning thing. Um, so, hey, Stuart Former, glad to see you're here. When you're not off kissing giraffe or making, you know, or, or taking close close up pictures of, of penguins, come on, man. All is there right. any interest in meeting in person? Do we um, have the answer is I'm, I imagine so, but nowadays it's there's, um, it, it would A, where would be a place to do it? Right. And, uh, and B, where would be a place to do it? We used to be able to do it for free at the uh, admission trails and the problem is it's no longer free mm. uh and i'm not sure that that's a problem we still could meet there in person i'm sure the club would be, what we have to do is we have to pay for the pay for the security nowadays because of the way in which the city changed things so that's certainly something that can be done is to meet in person it's just a matter of finding location and certainly we can work on that if there's enough interest And you physically, where are you? Oh, I'm up in Scripps Ranch. Yeah. Yeah. Dave? Yeah. Um, we've been meeting online since COVID started. I'm, I'm Stuart. Some of you know me. I, I run the M Mount Diablo Astronomy Society ASIC group, and I'm also a San Diego astronomy member. We've been doing online. It's been real successful, mostly because um, people are able to share their screens, and we can talk about different processes and and uh, troubleshoot problems like in real time on whatever program they're using. Um, it's nice, to, nice to work in person, but you know that way uh, people can say, "Oh, look, this is the image that I've been working on," and just throw it up and share the screen. It just requires a good moderator. That's all. Certainly, one of the things that we used to do quite a bit is something called fix your picks. Um, Basically, we there since there's a lot of people that know how to do the processing and things like that. Uh, we have other members that would say, "Hey, I'm running into this issue, or this is what my final images are looking like. What do you think I'm doing wrong?" So, a couple of times, a couple of times a year, we'd have a fix your pick session, just to go through what people had done and just kind of evaluate and say, "Okay, this is what I see going on." Um, and uh, that's that's we can do that a couple of times if you'd like. That works out pretty well. Uh, any other thoughts? 
Is anyone um, on Astro Bean or familiar with it? I, I just think it's a it's a good platform to introduce to anyone in this hobby because it's a good. Uh, I'm, I'm not advert advertising for them, of course, but it's a good place to share work and compare other people's work, just in case uh, you guys are interested. Um, I've I've been I've been a member of Astrobin for a whole long time, but haven't posted anything lately. I didn't post anything until very recently. Um, for those that that aren't familiar with it, Astrobin is a, if you will, it's a. Um, they they call it a social networking group for astro imagers. Uh, it's a great place to share images, thoughts. I have not been involved in any of the discussions, things like that. Um, and Zhu, if you wanted to. Um, you know, have a just do a quick talk on uh, at some point in time, just talk about the benefits of it. That'd be great. Uh, sure. Yeah, I just found it useful that uh, you can look up for potential targets you want to image and also do play solving and tell you like where is what coordinates, where is it in part of the sky? And, and also you can compare work um, with other people on the same target, different processing flavors, technique. It's uh, anyway, it's just a good place to share, share work. And we can later on, we can share, share the screen next time for five, 10 minutes. If anyone is interested, sure. Yeah. Uh, in the past, we've had, uh, we've had guest speakers um, uh, before anybody was trying to make money on astrophotography. I could talk just about anybody to come in and talk. And I mean, I think the biggest coup I ever got was Tony Hallis who is infamously not a uh, not a, a presenter, but I was able to get Tony to talk to us at one point in time. Uh, I've already spoken with Ken Crawford. Uh, Ken is the president, um, I guess he's um, president of the board of directors of AIC, among other things. He is, you know, I've already talked to him once about possibly speaking at us, and he's all for it. Um, uh, Craig Stark is kind of out of the game these days. I haven't seen, I haven't talked to him, but he developed a program called Nebulosity, and he was phenomenal as a guest speaker. Um, I actually still have people signing up to my YouTube channel um, specifically to go listen to Craig Stark talk about stuff. Uh, Craig Crinklaw, Sky Tools, uh, I'm going to try to get him on. Yeah. But if you guys can think of folks that you want to hear talk, I'll, I don't mind you know, pestering folks and saying, here, you know, can you talk? Um, certainly, hey, we've got to, you know, we've got Stuart Foreman could talk to us. Yeah, Stuart, Stuart's famous. He could talk to us. <laughs> so anyway, if you got some uh, session on planning tools, um, the, the answer is, yeah, um, I'm sure we can, Jerry. Um, you say, uh, so you're using Astro Planner. Um, has anybody started to use uh, Sky Tools 4? Ooh. I use Telescopius. Okay. And, and um, it's free and it you can search by anything and put in any parameters you want and sort by anything you want. It's an awesome online service. And I ended up just throwing in some money just because I use it you know, in, in our South American scope, that's how I know what's up in the sky and how high it is and when it transits and how big it is and how bright it is and all that stuff. So I'm kind of, again, just kind of looking over Michael Sherman. Um, um, Mike, Sky, Tools, want to... Sky Tools' database is proprietary and you can't add to it with other catalogs that exist. Like, he curates that uh, database and he brings in the guy data and, and does the corrections himself. If you want to be able to add any kind of a catalog down to MAG 22, the Astro Planner just lets you directly pull in those catalogs and use them. So, yeah. you know, for some of the stuff above MAG 15, it gets a little dicey trying to find objects uh, unless you're using Gaia data. Astro Planner is great. Yeah. So here's an idiot question. What's wrong with Stellarium for that? Stellarium's great. I, you know, it, it's a wonderful free planetarium program. The only issue with it is it's limited in the uh, catalogs that you can integrate. And one of the problems you run into it is like when 
All right, so right now I did planning from uh, plus eight to plus 11 uh, uh, RA and pulled in 490 asteroid objects to look at at this time of year that are rising in the east. So Astro Planner uh, will pull in the 1.2 million asteroid objects from the MPC database and allow you to select out just that little cut of 490 rocks. And uh, then you've got that as uh, ready to go to give you the location of the things at night. With uh, Stellarium, if you add more than about 50 asteroid objects to it, it slows so it slows down so fast that it's almost unusable. So you have it's great if you've got the target in mind that you want to use, and you drop that into it and say go get it. Because uh, I still use Stellarium because it works great with Nina for populating targets, right? But I don't. I don't try to use it as a general planner because you can't pull enough objects into it without slowing it down. Thanks. I just want in the planning perspective, um, Nina users probably know that the software Nina also has the planning feature. Similar to Telescopius, uh, uh, you can filter and look up for different kinds of objects you're looking for and know the transient time and how long it will be above horizon, blah, blah. So it's also a good free source of uh, planning and target selection. Hmm. Wow. Okay. And it allows you to add that plugin for exoplanets. So every night you can use it to see which exoplanets are hot and uh, Populate quickly with that plugin. And this is a Nina? Yeah, Nina wow. will directly connect to Stellarium. So you can sit there with Stellarium when you're trying to plan and pick something and then go over to Nina and hit the import button uh, from your planetarium program. It also, what's that one that it uses? Cirque de Sol, or I can't remember, I think that's what it's called. So you can use that tool, but those are the only two that it supports right now. And I haven't figured out a way yet to import anything from Astro Planner. So, hmm. wow. Okay. So, so the main things I'm picking up for tonight was that we need to figure out a way to do a boot camp for those folks that are want that want to get started. Uh, we're going to send out a meeting or a notice so that uh, people who are not currently on the Astro Imaging Special Interest Group's I.O. page can get connected. Um, we need to talk a little bit. We need to get a hardware, something going, at least a, a beginner session on, on all the different types of hardware. Uh, I've seen uh, at least a session on planning software. Um, processing. And, um, Did he, was there, when we talk about the club's resources like a tear dissel, or how do those fit into the possibility of doing some of this stuff? Well, let me tell you a little bit about, so the next slide up was basically about Tarot. Let me do this real quick. So Tarot was, uh, as a telescope, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a club owned piece of gear that is primarily set up to do high quality astro imaging. Uh, it's, totally, it's totally automated. Uh, myself and Jeff Herman are the, are the observatory managers for it. Uh, basically, it consists of, of uh, it's, it's extremely high quality gear. It consists of a 14 and a half DSI, Deep Sky Instruments, uh, Richie Creation Astrograph. Uh, it has a significant amount of, uh, of good, uh, it's, it's, the camera itself is an, is an Alta U16M uh, with a 16803 chip in it. Uh, the filter wheel has got, it's a 10 position filter wheel with um, both broadband, narrowband, and the Sloan filters in it for doing exoplanet work. Uh, it all sits on top of a, of a software BISC uh, mount, ME mount, uh, and it does a tremendous amount. It does, it makes tremendous pictures. Um, we are, we have put up 
Um, it's currently on the process of getting re uh, uh, re-outfitted with some new computer software and a new weather and a new weather system. But it runs pretty much remotely. Um, we're, we've put up on the website now a way to request data uh, or image uh, uh, image runs from the uh, from the system. And there's also a huge image archive that's available uh, for anybody to, to anybody in the club to access. And that image archive contains roughly 50, 50 different image sets uh, that are extremely high quality that if you want to be able to learn how to process data on, is extremely good data for learning how to process. Um, it, uh, the way in which that archive has been set up is that it's got complete data sets in it. So you've got everything from soup to nuts, including darks, bias, flats, uh, for anything you want to do. Um, and it's also there's also master frames uh, for each of the filters for any particular for for a various different objects. So you don't have to go through the process of doing all the calibration work. You can go right toward image combination and all that fun stuff. Uh, we'll have a separate uh, session on how to access it and how to request data. From from Taro, but that's one of the acts. That's one of the the, uh, the club assets that's been kind of underused lately. We just haven't had a whole lot of access to it. So if you're looking for really high quality data um, and need access to that data archive, send an email to Taro at sdaa.org, and we'll get you access to all that data archive. And it makes phenomenal pictures. Um, it makes really, really good stuff. Is other questions reason, or anything? Is the reason like cruising and the other observatories no good because of long focal length? Well, they're not really set up for astro imaging. Um, they uh, the, the the cruise and observe the two observatories and the cruise or the two the telescopes and the cruise and observatories uh, aren't really well set up for photography. Um, just because the amount of work and the amount of specialized gear that goes into doing it. Uh, I think they probably, the way that the, the cruising the, um, the, the cruise observatory went is that, okay, we've got a, uh, we've got a, 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 a uh, we, the thought was is that at some point in time, cruising could have been set up for, for astro imaging. But I think after, uh, after many years of trying to put it together, the first steps was just try to make it a, a, a a, a visual observatory with two real good visual scopes and take it from there. Why, why, so I've got a CCD camera, two inch mount. Why couldn't I just plop that into the eyepiece and um, use the software and why wouldn't that work? Uh, primarily because the mounts aren't, aren't the, the mounts there aren't good enough to be able to track well enough for long, long exposure photography. And there's no there's no auto guiding on any of the telescopes there. So how about a whole bunch of short uh, exposures and then just stack them? I don't even think it'd be terribly good for that. Um, it's they're really set up for for visual. One of the telescopes has got a a focal length of eighteen on it. Um, and while the 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 the, uh, the TOA one thirty is a great astro imaging scope, uh, it's not very it's it doesn't have all the appropriate parts on it to make it a uh, to make it an imaging telescope. I will tell you that when Terry Arnold donated that scope, uh, he was he was attempting to take photographs with in downtown San Diego and never quite got all there with it. Not to mention that the roof blocks the southern uh, exposure. Yes. The observatory was not exactly put in the proper orientation, but that's another. Anything else, gents? I will go ahead and put out some some quick uh, some quick notes on what we talk about tonight. If Jensen there's B. any, what's that? Gents and B. Come on, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking out for you, B. You are. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to get them later for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, I'll put together some meeting notes. Um, you know, again, 
mostly what I'm looking for is to, for ideas, get people involved in, in, in speaking and stuff. It sounds like we've got some good experts involved. Um, we'll put together at least an initial plan. We'll, 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 during, the winter, during the summertime, some, uh, we'll put together a, uh, I'll work with a few of the experienced folks. We'll put together a boot camp and get that out as a, as a notification for folks. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? B, you're talking and it's muted. Hey, Dave. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, with Tarot, I'm just curious. Could uh -huh. I ask it to track something like the International Space Station? Would it do it? Could it do it? Probably not. The answer is it probably could, but I'm not sure how you could set up a session to do that. Uh -huh. uh, Tarot is actually, is, is, we've been running ACP for, I don't know, six years, something like that. Uh, Jeff Herman was the wrote that wrote all the scripts for it. I'm not sure that we could actually do anything. Not that you couldn't move the mount fast enough to do it, but I'm not quite sure how you'd set the session up to do so. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things I'd like to do in rookie in boot camp. <laughs> to take a picture of the space station. Yeah, you know, I've always loved action photography before astronomy stuff, and I think it'd be really fun. It's a, it's a cool challenge all over YouTube. I want to try it. Just another so idea. There are several several programs. Actually, Nina has a plugin to track um, asteroids or, or ISS and satellites. Uh, it loads the real time coordinates, and it, it adjusts your equatorial mount tracking. It makes it into a customer rate, uh, and and you can track it. Given that your mount can move fast enough and has enough pointing accuracy, so Nina is one option. Oh, and there are, uh, Voyager also recently as the asteroids and uh, comets and satellites tracking a similar way, look out for the data and, and start tracking. Um, and there are some oh. people customized program that I'm, I haven't experienced. So there's a way, but this big 40 and a half inch stuff that it might be it might be challenging give me a small field of view and it's challenging i don't know how it's set up at tarot but yeah right thanks good info thanks um Stuart, you still there you guys run you you, you run voyager down in south america don't you yeah yeah we're still, we're, we're still trying to figure it out <laughs> it's you know we had um it's it's sort of it's a little bit of blind leading the blind i had a guy who came in and helped us one day to to help us set up? We're, we we got it good enough that we can get a um, uh, we can get a a, a target, and um, we figured out how to move the target over to the sequence. We figured out how to do drag scripts, so we're sort of learning it, you know, kind of by fire. I tried that reading the um, manual; it's eight hundred pages long. <laughs> We can talk, Stuart. I, I've been using Voyager at my remote observatory for two, three years. Yeah. I, I'm I'm currently on using the advanced version. You probably know that. And it's similar. Nina also recently similar introduced a plugin. Basically, it's it's so convenient for for already set up equipment a setup. All I do is I add in the target I want to image. I, I have a list of maybe 50 or a hundred targets that I want to image ever. And Voyager just plan itself, picking up the most suitable and highest priority target per day, per, per time. And he it just shoot. And nice. uh, it, it will automatically pick the other one and blah, blah, blah. And so it's, uh, all I do is I, I click start of the drug script sometime during the day and I download data the next morning. So there's nothing else I need to do. That's the that's Voyager what Voyager can do and also Nina, the free program is getting close as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we can talk more if you have specific question about Voyager. I I'm an right. early adopter for Voyager and I've been talking with Leo, the, the author, pretty frequently. Nice. Yeah. Well, we're as, as as soon as I know enough to ask intelligent questions, then I will. But sure. I'm not quite there yet. Okay. Yeah. What's the best way to contact or communicate with you? Uh, with me? Um, yeah. Uh, I can put my, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can put my email here. Uh, 
Oh, you can ask yeah. questions in the groups I.O. I just signed up. Uh, I okay. think I should be get visibility there. Yeah. All right, guys. It's been fun. Let's see if we can make this thing rock and roll again. Appreciate awesome. everybody showing up. You had pretty good. You had, you had better response than I thought. So it's good stuff. Yes. Thanks, Dave. All right, guys. Y'all have a great yeah, evening. Thanks, Dave. Great job. All right, guys. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye. Bye.